Good morning, everyone, and <coughs> thank you to Mark and the members of the organizing committee for the invitation to be here today. There's nowhere else I'd rather be today, but I wish the reason for us being here had not come to pass. Um, <coughs> I first met Athena, I think it was the 1980 neuroscience meeting at St. Louis, and we began talking about, do the slides change on this? Where do they change? He's done it. <coughs> we, and we began talking about attempts that we were beginning to make in the, in the lab in Cambridge to begin to study uh, aspects of drug addictive behavior. And we were, we were particularly interested in the learning and memory mechanisms that are engaged to underlie drug seeking. And there's this nice uh, formal uh, email from Athena, dear Dr. Everett. She was always very respectful back then, in 1991, <laughs> <coughs> um, saying that she really was interested in, in doing this. And we began to evolve a plan for her to come and visit us in Cambridge to set about trying to develop a way of looking at behavior which maximized and enabled us to measure the impact of, of drug-associated stimuli on the foraging for drugs, the seeking of drugs. And so, Athena uh, duly arrived in the lab. I think this is a placebo. It doesn't. It's, it's a delusional belief that I have control, and I, I don't. I don't even have control over these arrows. Nothing works down here. Oh. See, it's not just me. Yeah. It's working now. I'm sorry that I s set the stage for this kind of behavior. Yeah. <laughs> hey. So, yep. So, Athena arrived in the lab after that email, which was in January 1991. She arrived in the lab that summer with Mark. They flew separately into separate airports, uh, at, but coordinated and arrived in Cambridge. When I say arrived, this is arrived rather in the way that a hurricane arrives at the southwest coast of America. She came with this determination and enthusiasm and a box of tools from, that she'd brought from San Diego to re-educate us in our initial attempts to, to achieve intravenous self-administration of cocaine in rats, and to try and evolve a procedure, a second-order schedule of reinforcement, which rats would perform that maximized, oh that maximized, it's working too well now, that maximized the impact of stimuli that become associated with drugs and that we know activate brain networks to underlie um, behavior. And there's a little video here. Can you make that work? Because this is what uh, Athena th helped us achieve. There. So from just enabling animals to self-administer cocaine, and Athena loved this video, by the way, here we have a rat that's trained to respond on a lever, and he's responding a lot on that lever to illuminate presentations of this light CS, which has been paired with cocaine. And he will do that, as you see in the graphic on the right, for 15 minutes in a way that's powerfully under the control of these drug-associated condition stimuli. So these condition stimuli acting as condition reinforcers mediate the delay to eventually a a acquiring an intravenous cocaine self-administration. And there's a profound effect that you see there of adding the light CS in response to these lever presses. This is a second order schedule of reinforcement, cocaine reinforcement. Uh, it, it had been done before in, in other labs in, in, in the world, but not quite like this because we had such a prolonged time of the rats foraging for their first infusion of cocaine, 15 minutes with this long delay uh, to, to reinforcement. And here are some of the data that Athena collected and analyzed with Mercedes Arroyo, a, a student in the lab at the time, 
which shows you this behavior. It shows you a 15-minute period in a rat that's now learned to do this, showing that it doesn't waste much time responding early on in the interval because there's no possibility of a cocaine infusion then, but that gradually its responding picks up in rate. These arrows are not infusions of cocaine, but earned presentations of the cocaine CS that are reinforcing these seeking responses. Initially with post-conditioned reinforcement pauses that get shorter and shorter, and at the end of the interval, the animal's responding, rather like you saw in that, in that video, to achieve a first infusion of cocaine. <coughs> when cocaine's on board, you can see what happens. They begin responding earlier. They earn many more CSs. They respond much more greatly. So cocaine effects on seeking cocaine. And when Athena came to the lab, and indeed around this, well before this, 1993, she published a, a significant review in psychopharmacology on animal models of craving. And this was why she was interested in helping us and to establish this procedure, that, that the cues that elicit drug craving in people, she knew of course you can't measure craving in rats, but you can measure the effects of those stimuli on observable behavior that might be related to the impact that those cues have on behaviors of, of humans uh, interacting with drugs. She also showed in these founding experiments back now in the <laughs> early 90s, again with Mercedes Arroyo, here, for example, if you just focus on that first period when the animals are working for their first infusion, their instrumental seeking behavior maintained by these CSs is directly related to the dose of the drug that they earn. The higher the dose of the drug, the more they work, and the lower the dose of the drug, the less they work. The opposite of what happens in a simple self-administration paradigm where that relationship is the other way around. You work less for more and it lasts for longer. So here, enabling us to distinguish between the motivation for drug and regulation for dr of drug taking. And this critical demonstration that if you remove the CS contingent on responding during a session, over a couple of days, their responding drops to this low level and then is rapidly reinstated again when the CS is a presented response contingently. So we, it took a few years to do this. It was difficult. Athena knew from the very start that we would need long duration catheter patency, IV catheter patency, which was a challenge. And we'd need to maintain these animals in a, in a way that enabled them to work for, for many weeks on end. But it's now a standard methodology in our lab. Only in our lab. It seems no one else in the world has ever <laughs> buckled down to do this, even though it provides such a powerful way of looking at the impact of drug CSs on behavior. And it enabled us then to start exploring the underlying neural mechanisms. And this had been at the heart of what Trevor Robbins and I had been trying to establish in the lab in Cambridge. At the time, I was still in the Department of Anatomy, and, and Trevor was in psychology, but we maintained a common lab that, that Athena joined to effect this ap approach to the study of behavior related to addiction. And with Athena, and experiments done by uh, Rachel Whitelaw, a graduate young graduate student in the lab, we showed that if you took the basolateral parts of the amygdala uh, offline with a, a selective lesion, animals simply couldn't acquire this drug-seeking behavior under a second-order schedule. And a little later, uh, Rotsuka, Rotsuka Iko showed that if you inactivated the core of the nucleus accumbens, the same was true. And subsequently, we showed that this is a system, a basolateral to amygdala to nucleus accumbens core system that underpinned the impact of conditioned reinforcement on cocaine-seeking behavior, consistent with the work that, that uh, Trevor and I had done with Martin Cador a few years earlier, isolating the condition reinforcement process and showing that it too depended upon interactions between the basolateral amygdala and the nucleus accumbens core. Having now established this difficult but nonetheless very reliable and stable procedure, and to have animals responding for long periods of time, that work evolved. And I'm just going to show you a couple of snapshots, snapshots of, th of things that we've been able to do subsequently. Again, a study by Rotsuko Ito in animals now that have been working under this schedule for a couple of months, such was the level of our success under Athena's guidance, to show that 
when the behavior was well established, the dopaminergic correlate of well established cocaine seeking is in the dorsal striatum, not in the nucleus accumbens core or shell. Yet, if you crept up on the animal with a surprising presentation of a, co a cocaine CS, it was able to increase dopamine in the core of accumbens rather selectively. And that the effect uh, on dopamine transmission in the dorsal striatum under a prolonged period of seeking was as great as actually the change in dopamine that occurs on self-administering the cocaine. And soon after that, uh, Luke van der Schurm, when he came to the lab, showed that actually when the behavior has gone through the acquisition stage and is now well stabilized and performed daily for weeks on end, this behavior becomes dependent on dopamine in the dorsolateral striatum. And this was the beginnings of our theorizing, the basis of our notion that drug-seeking transitions from being goal-directed in early acquisition to habitual when it's well established. And not only that, but this transition from ventral to dorsal striatum in the experiments of, of David Balin, who's now uh, back in Cambridge, who showed that in, in animals that were acquiring this uh, well-established cocaine-seeking behavior, there's a communication between the ventral striatum and the dorsal striatum through this recurrent circuitry involving connections with the midbrain dopamine system. And these data here show that if you make uh, a long-lasting selective lesion of the nucleus accumbens core and combine that with contralateral dopamine receptor antagonist infusions in the dorsolateral striatum, this produces a dose-dependent reduction in cocaine seeking, but only when it's well established, not early on. So as this behavior becomes habitual, the control over behavior that's earlier the property of the ventral striatum becomes subordinate to the dorsolateral striatum. And this really, data like this and others, are at the heart of the theorizing about the mechanisms underlying addiction that, that Trevor and I have engaged in over a number of years. And this element here, where the initial acquisition of drug seeking evolves over time into habitual behavior, automatically elicited by the Pavlovian stimuli that Athena came to the lab to help us study by looking at the impact of those, or measuring the impact of those drug-associated condition stimuli on drug-seeking behavior. And as this story has evolved, we've begun to understand how these habits may be the building, building blocks of the lot subsequent loss of control of behavior as it becomes compulsive, the compulsive drug-seeking behavior that characterizes addiction. And in that process over 20 years now, we've been able to explore and define the circuitry that underlies this uh, complex behavior. I can see the time's up, so I'm going to end now with, with this. Um, when I first met Athena, and when we first discussed about her coming to Cambridge, this was someone who just finished a superb PhD, as we'd heard um, from George in his lab, and wanted to explore something new in, in this domain of science. It was an intellectual interaction, and it set up a collaboration, and she came to the lab. And she brought all of this determination and enthusiasm and passion that characterized Athena's approach, not only to work, but the world. But there was another part of Athena, which I'm sure you all know about, which is that she was open to friendship. And indeed, we became friends, not just Athena and me, but Mark and Athena and me and my wife, Jane, who's here in this slide, and my daughter, Jessica, who's about four at the time. And this is all of us on vacation, a wonderful vacation in Greece, in Santorini and, and Skiathos, 24 years ago now. My daughter's now 28. She was four there. And I was talking to my daughter on Skype. She now lives in Sydney on Saturday and told her I was coming to attend this event. And she reminded me that, apart from the tremendous affection she has for Mark and Athena, that it was Athena who taught her how to be subversive. We were always pretty strict with Jess about going to bed in the evening, and Athena connived with Jessica every day to make sure that we never went out to dinner till 10 so that Jessica could be up after midnight. 
and midnight was the very thing that Athena, under the scenes, helped to do. She was a wonderful person. We miss her enormously, Mark.